So today I want to take a look. I want to focus on a part of the Torah portion that is uh, Ha'atzinu. And the part of the portion I want to focus on in chapter 32 of Devarim is the five places where there's a reference to the rock. And it's very interesting that this would be something that would be referenced. It's very interesting that this is a metaphor that Yahweh uses. And I want to now help connect some dots. Because when we go into the prophets, the Navim, and we also go into the um, Brit Kadashah or the Apostolic Writings, we're going to find that they referenced these sections many times. And we have to contextually always remember that the audience that, whether it was Kifa or Shaul or Matthew or Yeshua himself was talking to, these people already had the context of knowing the Song of Moshe. They already knew Devarim 32, Deuteronomy 32. And so they would have had a familiarity with this in the writings I'm going to quote out of Yeshayahu and out of the Psalms and out of other places. And so... The unfortunate thing is that most of mainstream Christianity, most people who've never really focused on this side, the left side, <laughs> anything to the left of Matthew, to the left of Matthew, they are lacking in understanding that the people listening to the, the comments would have had. They would have had that context. They would have known, oh, wow, he's referring to that rock that we're reading about here in Devarim 32. So let's look at some of these verses and then start connecting the dots. Now, in doing this, I'm going to be connecting some dots that are referencing Yahweh and that are referencing Yeshua and showing the connection between them. This teaching, I want to kind of as a disclaimer, is not designed to set straight and for the record the nature of the the Godhead, the nature of whatever it is that's up there looking down upon us, okay? Because I know that that's a stumbling block and it's a problem and we're going to see why through Scripture it's actually prophesied to be a problem. But... Because Yeshua quoted these verses and made the connection to himself, because Kepha did and Shaul did and the other writers of the Gospels did, I think it's important that we then make the connections ourselves. And so I like Yochanan, and I'm going to quote from First Yochanan chapter 3 and verse 2, I am not claiming any better than Yochanan to know exactly and understand exactly the nature of the Almighty and the Father and the Son and the whole Godhead thing. Okay, Yochanan, who certainly knew him better than I do, he lived with Messiah, and he had that interaction and that relationship that we do not have. He says in First Yochanan chapter 3 and in verse 2, he said, Beloved ones, now we are children of Elohim, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now, maybe I'm stretching things, but my read into this verse is that Yochanan did not fully understand what the nature is of the Almighty. He understood what aspects have been revealed, but it says that there are parts of it that have not yet been revealed. He says it has not yet been revealed. But what he did know is that when we see him, we'll see him and we'll see him as he is and we'll be like him. And so that's the context that I want to have to wrap this teaching in, is that I'm not trying to make a positional stand as to trying to set straight the nature that we are told has not yet been revealed in its full clarity. But I am connecting dots that they want us to connect because they make it really clear that they want us to connect these dots in the way that they word their verses. So let's go ahead and see what we can find out about the rock. Let's study and understand what it is that the Almighty would have us learn about the rock. So we'll start in Devarim in Deuteronomy chapter 32, and we'll look at verse 3. So Devarim, Deuteronomy 32, and in verse 3. For I proclaim the name of Yahweh, ascribe greatness to our Elohim, the rock. His work is perfect, for all his ways are right ruling. An L of truth without unrighteousness, righteous and straight is he. So this is the first place in the song we're reading about the rock. So the rock is perfect, his work is perfect, all his ways are right ruling, And this rock is an L of truth without unrighteousness. This rock is an L of truth without unrighteousness. And I'm going to read the other verses here in Deuteronomy 32 before we start breaking down each one, just to kind of give us an idea of why we're doing this. So the first thing is we've said, wow, this is pretty important. 
We're reading about a rock that is perfect, his ways are perfect, and he's an L of truth. Look at verse 15. In verse 15, we're told that Yeshurun grew fat and kicked. You grew fat, you grew thick, you are covered with fat. So he forsook Eloah, who made him, and scorned the rock of his deliverance. So now we're seeing a connection between Eloah and the rock of deliverance. So we're told that we're looking at an L of truth, a rock whose ways are right rulings, and that this rock is a rock of deliverance. And again, it's connected not only to Yahweh, to Eloah. These words are all connecting. I'm just kind of laying out the pieces of the puzzle before we start piecing them together. In verse 18, we're going to stay in Devarim here, in chapter 32. In verse 18, it says, You neglected the rock who brought you forth, and forgot the El who fathered you. So in this song, which talks about their fall and their punishment and then eventually their return, he says that the reason that they had their fall is because they neglected this rock, the rock who brought you forth. So this is a very important rock. And then the connection is made in the next part of the verse, and forgot the El who fathered you. So now we have a connection that this rock is most likely the El who fathered them. Then we look in verse 30, and in verse 30 it says, How would one chase a thousand and two put to ten thousand to flight, unless their rock had sold them and Yahweh had given them up? So now we're reading that this is a rock that protects, and that only this could happen if the rock had given them up, if the rock had sold them into the punishment, if, the, if Yahweh had given them up. Because he's saying that when they're punished, that this will happen, that one will chase 10,000 and two will put 10,000 to flight. And this could only happen, though, if their, their rock, the rock, had allowed it to happen. Then we turn to verse, excuse me, in verse 31, I want to continue where it says, For their rock is not like our rock, even our enemies are judges. So there is other rocks, just like we're told not to worship other Elohim, other mighty ones. They believe that their rock will save. They believe that their rock delivers. They believe that their rock will do all kinds of things. And what Yahweh tries to tell us and teach us is that their rock is nothing more than a rock. <laughs> it's just a piece of stone. But as a metaphor, our rock is a foundation. Our rock is a deliverer. Our rock has power. He's the cornerstone. And we're going to read so much more about that today. Now, in look in verse... 36. For Yahweh rightly rules his people and has compassion on his servants when he sees that their power is gone and there is no one remaining shut up or at large. And he shall say, Where are their mighty ones, the rocks, small are there, in whom they sought refuge? See that connection? There's two rocks being discussed here. The metaphorical rock of the Goyim, the Gentiles, the world, that are just made out of stone. And then the rock, capital R, which has the power to deliver, that's the one that has the right rulings and, ha and is an L of truth, the rock that is the one who brought them forth, the one that, if he pulls his protection away, will allow us to be in the place where one would chase away a thousand and two ten thousand. There is now being mentioned really clearly, as always throughout Devarim, not to mention the rest of scriptures, Moshe is making this point that there is a difference between what they worship and who they worship and what they believe in and the fact that it is useless and has no power and who we worship and who we believe in who has all power. And so in this song that Moshe was instructed to write, we find that the song has, you know, some 40 something verses to it. And then we have five, which is about you know, one-eighth of the verses, five verses that deal specifically with this rock. So I think we're supposed to be, you know, it's almost like Yahweh's beating us over the head saying, this idea of the rock is real important. It's a metaphor I'm going to be using in the future. It's something that you're going to be looking forward to. So I want to make sure you get it clearly in your head. As a matter of fact, you know how you've listened to the radio sometimes or somebody will walk by and you'll hear a song and you can't get it out of your head? Well, this is the song we're not to get out of our head. Moshe sang this to the people so that they would never forget what he sang in this song. And part of that song 
was to be fully embracing their rock, not the world's rock. The rock with a capital R, not the rock with a small r. Okay? Now, let's start to break this down into some component pieces. Let's start in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 1. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and what we're going to do is we're going to look at some verses from the Brit Kadashah, from the Apostolic Text, and show how when they were talking about things regarding Yeshua, that they were connecting him to the rock here from Devarim chapter 32. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and in verse 1, it says, For I do not wish you to be ignorant, brothers, that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And all were immersed into Moshe in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed, and that rock was Mashiach. However, with most of them, Elohim was not well pleased, for they were laid low in the wilderness, and these became examples for us, so that we should not lust after evil as those indeed lusted. Now, let's kind of keep this in, in clear perspective. So he's here talking, and as he's talking, he's talking to people that are supposed to be hearing Moses preached every Shabbat in the synagogue. And so they're supposed to be familiar with Devarim 32, and he's, they're supposed to be familiar with the accounts of the Exodus. And he's saying, look, I'm trying to help you make this connection between those events and the Mashiach that I'm preaching to you, so that you understand the connection. And here it is. He says that all of them, as they're going through this process in the wilderness, all drank from that same spiritual drink. They drank from the same spiritual rock, and that rock was Mashiach. There's no gray or ambiguity here. He is straightforward saying the rock that's being talked about here, the rock that was involved with Israel in the desert, that rock was Mashiach. He's not beating around any bushes. And so this is an important piece of our puzzle. Somehow we have to make this connection between the rock being that they were experiencing and dealing with in the desert with the rock that is Mashiach. Now now look at, we're going to look at Deuteronomy 32, 3 and 4 in context. Remember we were reading there that he was an L of truth. This rock is an L of truth whose ways were perfect. And so now let's look at how that references from the Brick Kadashah. Yochanan 14, John 14 and in verse 6. Because now we're going to look at those five sections from Deuteronomy 32 and break them down. So the first part was that we're dealing with a rock that's the L of truth. Well, in Yochanan 14, in John 14, and in verse 6, Yeshua says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There are those who believe it might be better translated by saying, I am way, I am truth, and I am life, as opposed to the way or the truth. He is way. There, there is just one way. He is way. He is truth, and he is life. So now, there's a connection that we know that he is the truth and that he is life. We're told in Deuteronomy 32, in verse 3 and 4, that the rock was an L of truth. Now, we're also told that he was perfect in his ways and perfect in his righteousness in Deuteronomy. And we read in Hebrews 15, uh, excuse me, Hebrews 4 and verse 15, Ivrim, Ivrim 4, and in verse 15, For we do not have a high priest unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who was tried in all respects as we are, apart from sin. So now we're dealing with someone who was righteous in all his ways. So these are things that connect. As people are being hearing this stuff that, was, that we're reading from Yochanan, when Yeshua says he's the truth, we also know that they're looking for the rock of truth that they're not supposed to neglect or forget or forsake. And he is saying, well, I am the truth. And here in Ivrim in Hebrews, the writer saying, that Yeshua, the Mashiach, was tried, was tested, but, but he was perfect in his walking of the ways, and he was perfect in righteousness. And remember, we've talked about this before, that righteousness is something you do. Okay, it's acts and your behaviors in walking in submission to the Torah that gets you declared righteous. Okay, in other words, Yahweh says to do something and you do it, 
That's righteousness. When Yahweh said to Abraham, go ahead and do something, and Abraham went and did it, then Yahweh says that that was accounted to him for righteousness. Obedience to what Yahweh says is what has you declared righteous. Now, the next section from Deuteronomy is talking about a rejected stone. In Devarim 32 and in verse 15, the reference was to the rejected stone. I'm just going to turn there real quickly so I can just read it to you again. In Deuteronomy 32, it says, But yes, your own grew fat and kicked. You grew fat and grew thick, and you were covered with fat. And so he forsook Eloah, who made him, and scorned the rock of his deliverance. So we're talking about a rock that is rejected, a rock that is scorned. Let's go to Yeshayahu, to Isaiah 53 in verse 2. Yeshayahu 53 and in verse 2. For he grew up before him a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or splendor that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should desire him. Despised and rejected by men, a man of pains and knowing sickness, and as one from whom the face is hidden, being despised, and we did not consider him. So we know that Yeshayahu 53 is all about Mashiach. It's all about the Messiah. So it's describing the Mashiach as one who is despised and rejected. This matches very well with Deuteronomy 32 and verse 15. Let's read more. In Yeshayahu 28 and verse 16. Stay in Yeshayahu, go to 28 and in verse 16. Therefore, thus said the Master Yahweh, See, I am laying in Sion a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a settled foundation. He who trusts shall not hasten away. He who trusts shall not hasten away. That's another Hebraic idiom for eternal life. Extended days, the prolonging of days, not hastening away. This has the idea of of eternal life. So we're now connecting again this precious foundation stone, a tried stone, a, a, a settled stone that needs to be trusted in. Now let's look at Psalm 118, Tehillim 118. Psalm Tehillim 118 and in verse 21. In verse 21 we read, I thank you for you have answered me and have become my deliverance. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief's cornerstone. Okay, so now, in, in, as you read this, let's make that connection. First he says, in verse 21, this, the, Thank you, you have answered me, you have become my deliverance. We have already read in Deuteronomy 32 that this was a rock of deliverance that was scorned. So when you start to read these words, we're supposed to, he wants us to connect them together. So you hear the word deliverance, and the becoming of deliverance, and then you see in the next verse that the stone that the builders rejected, right away our brain should go, oh, we're talking about a rejected deliverance, a rejected stone, a scorned rock. That's Deuteronomy 32 and verse 15. And he said, this was from Yahweh, verse 23, and it was marvelous in, in our eyes. Now, the whole idea here, again, is connecting the dots. The psalmists, the prophets, the apostles... Yeshua always was referencing back to the things from the Tanakh that needed to be brought to remembrance and also to help connect the dots. And so that's what we need to be doing here. So we're now connecting up in verse 15 the idea of a deliverance rock that was rejected or scorned. We read in verse 2 and 3 of Isaiah 53 that Yeshua or the Mashiach that was to come was going to be despised and rejected by men. We read about a precious stone, a stone of foundation in Isaiah 28. And we read about here, the stone that the builders rejected had become the chief cornerstone. Now let's take all that, that context that we just laid out there, and look at Matthew 21. Turn to Matthew 21 and read the words of Yeshua. In Matthew 21 and in verse 33. Matthew 21 and in verse 33. Here another parable. There was a certain man, a householder, who planted a vineyard and placed a hedge around it, and dug a winepress in it and built a watchtower. And he leased it to farmers and went abroad. And when the season of the fruits drew near, he sent his servants to the farmers to receive its fruit. And the farmers took his servants and beat one and killed one, and they stoned another. 
Again he sent other servants more than the first, and they did likewise to them. And at last he sent his son to them, saying, They shall respect my son. But when the farmers saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and let us possess his inheritance. And they took him, and they threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Therefore, when the master of the vineyard comes, what shall he do to those farmers? And they said to him, Evil ones, he shall bring them to evil destruction, and lease the vineyard to other farmers, who shall give to him the fruits of their seasons. Yeshua said to them, Did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? This was from Yahweh, and it is marvelous in our eyes. We just read that verse from the Psalms. From Psalm, he was quoting directly to Helene 118. So let's look at what he's talking about here. He's quoting and saying, you know what? This parable is about the people. And, he, and, he, and Yahweh called the people and placed a hedge of protection around them. He gave them the Torah. The Torah is a hedge of protection. And he gave them this hedge of protection, and he gave them a watchtower. And there's so many references in Scripture, we don't have time to go into any of them at this point, about the watchman and the watchtower and being a watchman on the wall. And so he had set watchmen on the wall. And then when it was time, he sent out the prophets. And what do we read in Scripture? And Yeshua scolds them for this as well. He says, there wasn't a prophet you guys ever saw that you didn't kill, that you didn't reject. And yes, they did this to prophets. They stoned them. They killed them. And then he said, even at some point, finally, the father sent his son. Obviously, he's directly referring to himself here, and that they would again do the same thing to him that they did to the prophets, which is reject him and then to kill him. But see how he makes the connection, though. After saying all of that, he's trying to connect and say, remember, now his audience is 100% Jewish. He is not preaching to the rest of Israel. He is not preaching to the Goyim. He is in the land that at this point, the only audience he would have would be Jewish people. Okay? And the Jews at the time who would have known the scriptures, okay, they would know what he was referring to when he said the stone which the builders rejected had become the chief cornerstone. They would absolutely, these are, these are all people who are from the tribe of Judah, or at least from the kingdom of Judah, so they could have been from other tribes that had thought of themselves as Judah, because they were from the, the southern kingdom that had returned from the Babylonian captivity. And they would have been studied in the verses, and they would have been knowledgeable about Psalm 118 and the other verses in Yeshayahu that we read in Isaiah. And I'm sure they would have been astounded as he's sitting there and he's teaching them and he's connecting these dots to this stone, to this cornerstone, this precious cornerstone. Now this is, in the context, I want you to keep that in your mind. And now let's read what Paul had to say in Ephesians chapter 2 with all of this that we just read in mind. And see how Rav Shaul connects the dots. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 19. Ephesians chapter 2. And in verse 19 he says, So then you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the set-apart ones and members of the household of Elohim. Here's the context. Now, you ready? Having been built upon the foundation of the emissaries and prophets, Yeshua Messiah himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building being joined together grows into a set-apart dwelling place in Yahweh, in whom you are also being built together into a dwelling of Elohim in the Spirit. So here is Rav Shaul, who would have been more knowledgeable about the verses I quoted than probably anybody else walking around at his time. And he's quoting this to the Ephesians to give them an understanding as they've been studying. They've probably been doing the weekly Torah portion. They've been learning about Moses. They've been learning about Torah. They've been learning about everything from the Tanakh. They've been reading from the prophets. And he's trying to connect the dots saying, See, when we walk through this whole process, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but you are now fellow citizens. But not just citizens of anything, but you're citizens and members of the household of Elohim, which is built a certain way. It's built on the foundation of the emissaries, the prophets, the writings, and Yeshua being the chief cornerstone. See, this is the biggest problem for those who are from Judah and those who are from the, the scattered Goyim and the nations of the Israelites, the, the Ephraimites, whatever word you want to use for the lost ten tribes and the rest of the world that's out there. The problem is they're not connecting the dots here. 
Okay? The Jews are looking for a Mashiach to come that has not come yet. They are not accepting that Messiah has come. They are not accepting that he is the chief cornerstone. They don't understand that. On the other hand, those who are in the churches, those who have been scattered that are coming back and seeking the Almighty, but doing it through a Christianized mindset, they've rejected the cornerstone because Yeshua is the walking, talking, living Torah. We talk about this every week. And so they rejected the structure of the house that they're, they're supposed to be dwelling in. This house is built with the teachings and instructions of the Almighty. It's built on that stuff, and Yeshua being the chief cornerstone of it. And so when they reject Torah, they're rejecting the chief, the chief cornerstone. And again, for those who maybe haven't heard it, and we do it every week as a way of reminder, the three-verse loop. Yeshua said, I am the truth. We read that already in Yochanan 14.6. In Psalm 119, verse 142, we're told that the Torah, or the Word, is truth, that the entirety of the Word is truth, in verse 160 of Psalm 119. And then we're told in chapter 1 of John, of John, in verse 14, that Yeshua, the Word, was made flesh and dwelt amongst us. So Yeshua just isn't the right hand, sitting at the right hand of the Father, waiting to come in power and glory as King of Kings. Yeshua is the walking, talking, fleshly Torah. He is the Torah in its ultimate fulfillment. It is the goal of the Torah for us to become like Yeshua. And so he is the foundation, the cornerstone of all of this, so that we can be built, and it says, joined fitly together to grow into that set-apart dwelling place in Yahweh. But yet, we're told by Moshe, by the prophets, by the writer of the Psalms, and all these other places, that we have this problem, we have this tendency to reject the stone, to despise the stone, to write off the stone as being insignificant. And it's very sad. It leads to all the cursing. I want to look now at Yeshua as the foundation of the house. Because we just read this, that he's the cornerstone of the building. Matthew, Yahu, Matthew chapter 7 and verse 24. Yeshua is that foundation of everything that we do and everything that we believe. As described both consistently from the Tanakh, the prophets, the writings, and the apostolic writings of the Brick Shah. Matthew chapter 7 and in verse 24. The beauty is how consistent this message is everywhere you look in Scripture. Man is not smart enough to do that. Man could not contrive this and write it down this way and put it all together and be that consistent with the metaphors and the, and the pictures and the foreshadowings and the prophecies that you find in Scripture. We're just not that good. We're not that smart. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them shall be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain came down, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them shall be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain came down, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and they beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. See, there, there's this big, big picture being drawn here. And notice he's keeping using this term of the rock, built on the rock. Who is his audience? His audience is Judah. He's got a Jewish audience. These are all Jews. They, they're very well familiar with the references to the rock from the Song of Moshe, from the Psalms, from the Prophets. And here he is trying to explain to them, listen... Those of you who do these words of mine and hear them and do them. Wow, hear them and do them. What's that going to remind them of? The Shema? Shema Yisrael, right? Hear and do. This is something they said every day, several times a day in their prayers. So he says, everyone who hears, who Shema's these words of mine, hears and does them, shall be like a man who builds his house on the rock. See, you might have read that the first time you ever read that, and you're thinking, oh, that means he built it on something solid and strong. Yes, that's true, but that's such a tiny bit of scratching the surface of the meaning. The audience he was talking to completely understood immediately he was trying to connect them to what Moshe was talking about, what Isaiah was talking about, what the Psalms are talking about. And it wasn't until we started studying deeper into the Tanakh, into the Psalms and the writings, that we ever realize, hey, wait a minute, that's what he's talking about? Wow! How incredibly profound when we come to realize the depth of the connection 
that's there between the two. Now, you could also understand why this greatly disturbed the leadership of the day, because here this man is, who they just thought was a man, trying to connect himself to those verses. I mean, that was going to be a real challenge for them. They either had to accept him for who he was and who he is, or they had to have a real problem with it. And they were not open. They were not ready, a lot of them, to accept him for who he was and for who he is. Because then he says in verse 28, and he came to be, we're still in Matthew 7, okay, that when Yeshua had ended these words, that the people were astonished at his teaching. Why? Because his teaching them was as one possessing authority, not as the scribes. You see, here he is standing up teaching with authority, one that they could feel, they could palpably feel the authority, the power of his authority in telling them about this rock and connecting it to his instructions. When he says to them, therefore, everyone who hears and does, who shamas the words, these words of mine, okay, shall be like the man who's smart enough to build his house on the rock. Now, this is paralleled in uh, Luke chapter 6, but I want to read just a couple of verses from there. Luke six forty-seven to 49, because there's some little nuances of the wording that actually help bring more color and fullness to the picture. Luke chapter 6 and in verse 47. Everyone who is coming to me and is hearing my word and is doing them, I shall show you whom he is like. He is like a man building his house who dug deep and laid a foundation on the rock. And when a flood came, the stream burst against that house, but was unable to shake it, for it was founded on the rock. Do you see the picture here? Digging deep. Isn't that what we have to do in the Word? Dig deep into the Word? To dig deep and be grounded and deeply rooted in the Word, so that when the floods come, they can't knock you around? Is this not like the parable of the sower and the seed, where the ones that have the deep roots make it through, but the ones that don't are easily turned aside by the cares of the world, and they get, they get messed up when they panic? And here he's saying, look, when the floods burst and the streams burst and the flood comes, you will be unable to be shaken from it because you'll be founded on a rock. And you have to dig deep, though. Are you digging deep? Are you spending the time every day digging deep? Because listen to the alternative to this. Verse 49. But the one hearing and not doing is like a man who built a house on the earth without a foundation against which the stream burst and immediately it fell. And the ruin of that house was great. And the ruin of that house was great. Great. Now, for all of those of you who may have been coming out of that mainstream Christian background, all of you out there who still have friends that argue with you from that mainstream Christian background, do you hear the problem of that teaching of mainstream Christianity, that you don't have to do anything, how that conflicts with everything Yeshua, the Messiah, the, Mashiach, the one that they, that they think they're following, the Messiah that they, th- they claim to be following, who says very clearly, he says, everyone who is coming to me and is hearing my words and doing them. Now, whose words are what words is he referring to here? Well, let's connect the dots. Paul told us that the rock from the desert, the one they followed, the one who gave us the Ten Commandments, the one that gave us all the instructions, the one that hung out and talked to Moshe and gave him all the details, that's the one he's talking about. There is a connection of the dots here between the one who gave that and the one who's talking right here in the flesh. What we fight over is how that connection works. Let's not talk about that now. Let's just understand there's no doubt that there's a connection there. That they're one and the same in some way. Okay? Because they're being referred to as the same. Paul said it straightforward. The rock they followed in the desert was Mashiach. No, no, no ifs, ands, or buts. Okay? But now, he's saying here, the one hearing and doing what I'm teaching, the one who's coming to me, who's me? The Mashiach. Who's me? The Torah. The one who comes to the living, walking, talking Torah and hears the Torah and does the Torah is built on a solid foundation and can be then declared righteous. He says, but when you don't do and hear, excuse me, don't do what you hear me saying, well, it's foolish and you're just going to get wiped away with the flood. The waters are going to burst and just wipe you away. And it says, and great will be the ruin of that house. Great will be the destruction and ruin of that house. 1st Corinthians chapter 3. 1st Corinthians chapter 3. And we'll look at verse uh, 10 through 15 here. 
First Corinthians chapter three, verse 10. According to the favor of Elohim, which was given to me, a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it, but each one should look how he builds on it. Okay, so here's Shaul saying, look, according to the favor that Yahweh gave me, as a wise master builder, I've laid the foundation and another builds on it. So he said, look, I've, I've, I've laid out Yeshua for you. I've laid out the Torah for you. I've laid it out for you. I've, I've put it out there for you. He says, because no one is able to lay another foundation, verse 11, except that which is laid, which is Yeshua Messiah. So again, he's completely connecting the foundation, the foundation that we read about that was rejected, the chief cornerstone, the stone for a foundation from Isaiah 28. We have all of these connections here, and here again, Rav Shul is connecting them, and he said, look, there is no one is able to lay another foundation except that which is laid. So it's something that's already there, it's already been laid. You don't go and create your own new one in your own image, or, or just make one up for yourself. There is only one foundation, one true foundation, and it is Yeshua Mashiach. He says, and if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and straw, each one's work shall be revealed. For the day shall show it up, because it is revealed by fire. And the fire shall prove the work of each one, what sort it is. If anyone's work remains, which he has built it, excuse me, built on, he shall receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, but so as through fire. Do you not know that you are the dwelling place of Elohim, and that the Spirit of Elohim dwells in you? Are we following what he's talking about here? It's very, very important. He says here, that if anyone builds on this foundation, whatever you build is going to be tested and proved. Tested and proved. Wow, there's something about that sounds so familiar. Tested and proved. Tested and proved. Oh, wait a minute. Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 2. In Devarim 8 and verse 2, we're told that they were led through the desert for 40 years to humble them, to test them, to prove them, to see whether it was in their heart to keep the commandments or not. Deuteronomy 8, 2 and 3. It's a verse we quote all the time. So here he's telling you, look, I'm teaching you the same thing that, Dever, that Devarim is telling you, that Moshe told you. You're going to be tested to be proven to see whether it's in your heart to keep the commandments or not. And it's going to be tested by fire. That's why we're to told by Yaakov, you know, to count it joy in your fiery or various trials. And so it's going to all be burned away. Now, there is a connection here that gets confusing for people in verse 15, which says, If anyone's work is burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved. That only works if the person who suffers loss learns from what was, was suffering, learns from why he lost, and then teshuvahs, or returns, or turns around, and returns to the path of the Almighty, to walk in all his ways. See, that's the purpose of trials in fire, is to get your attention. Fiery trials are there to get your attention, to test you, to prove you, so that you can get your attention awakened and sparked so that you can be realize that maybe you're not doing things the way you need to be doing them so that you can make the necessary changes. Yahweh loves you enough that it says that like a father chastens a son, he chastens you. Why? He needs to get your attention so ultimately you will be safe. When a father gets the attention of his son, he knows that if I don't get the attention of my son now, something more dangerous and, and more critical is going to come up in his life that I may not be able to save him from. So I need, to, I need to get his attention now. And the same thing with the Almighty. He needs to get our attention now. And so he lets us go through these situations because he, he needs to wake us up. So we're told clearly here there's only one foundation that can be laid, and that foundation is Yeshua Messiah. But we're also told from the things that we read earlier that there is only one foundation, a stone for a foundation, a precious cornerstone. And so, again, we're told to make these connections it's all about Mashiach, and it's consistent. Let's continue in First Kepha and First Peter one. First Peter, First Kepha one, and in verse seven. First Peter, First Kepha one, and in verse seven. Here it says, "In order that the proving of your belief, much more precious than gold that perishes and proven by fire, might be found to result in praise and respect, and at this, and at the revelation of Yeshua Messiah." See the connection, how consistent that is with what Shaul just said? You know, Paul told us in Corinthians, and now Peter's telling us in his own writing here in his letter, he's saying, look, your belief is proved through the testing of fire, 
Because if you built on a foundation, if a trial comes upon you and you've dug deep and you've laid yourself, a built yourself a, a, a house, you've built your life on a solid foundation that's been dug deep, the trial is only going to be painful. It's not going to take you and wash you away into oblivion. Is that making any sense? They're saying the same thing. He said, the proving of your belief, which is more precious than gold, that perishes... I mean, you know, gold, you stick it in the fire. Eventually, it's just going to melt and disappear on you. It's going to turn to liquid and, and, and pour away. He said that it may be found to result in praise and respect and esteem at the revelation of Yeshua Messiah. This is the key. It all fits together. Lay the right foundation. Build and dig deep your foundation. Place it deep and then build a solid building on that foundation so that you will not be blown away, knocked over, washed away, or swept away. This is, you know, we're told that people get swept away, away by every wind of doctrine. Well, not if you're built on a solid foundation, you're not. not a, the wind can blow all at once against a solid foundation, and you're not going anywhere. That's the problem. That's the key. We have to be built on a solid foundation. Matthew chapter 16. Let's go to Matthew, Yahoo, Matthew chapter 16. And in verse 13. Matthew 16. And in verse 13. Now, when Yeshua came into the parts of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his taught one, saying, Who do men say the son of Adam is? And they said, Some say Yochanan the Immerser, others say Eliyahu, and others Yirmiyahu, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, And you, who do you say that I am? So you notice that he just made the connection. First he said, Who do they say the son of Adam is? But in case we're not sure who he's referring to, he now turns around and says, Well, who do you say that I am? And Shimon Kepha answering said, You are the Mashiach, the son of the living Elohim. And Yeshua answering said to him, Blessed are you, Shimon bar Yona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in the heavens. And I also say to you that you are Kepha, or a Kepha, a small pebble, but on this rock I shall build my assembly, and the gates of the grave shall not overcome it. What rock? The rock of the foundation of the, 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 the cornerstones. See, this is where everybody gets so messed up with the churches. They think, oh, he's building a church. He's setting a new thing. He's building a whole new deal here on Peter. No, the metaphor about the rock is consistent all the way through scriptures. And the reference to the rock is consistent all throughout scriptures. He's saying on this rock, what rock? The rock that I am the Mashiach, the rock of understanding that I am the chief cornerstone, the rock of understanding that I am the foundation. He says on that rock, I am going to build my assembly, my kihila, and the gates of the grave shall not overcome it. This is the key. This is the key. The rock is the understanding that he is the rock. On this rock, the rock of understanding that I am Mashiach. Because all the time the, the churches are all saying, oh, we are the church, we are the, you know, we're built on the rock, and Peter's the rock. He was given the keys, because the next verse says, I shall give you the keys. What are the keys of the kingdom? Okay? The keys of the kingdom are understanding the truths. What are the truths? The truths are in the words of Yahweh, the words of Yeshua. They're in everything that flows out of the mouth of the Almighty. Because that's the keys to heaven. That's the keys to our future. That's the keys to eternal life. It's very important that we understand this. But again, we have this reference to the rock. And Yeshua, again, talking to him, knew that they would have to connect up that word to what they've already known about and we're looking for and seeking to find and look for that foundational chief cornerstone. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 13. Yeshayahu 8 and verse 13. Yeshayahu chapter 8 and in verse 13. Yahweh of hosts, him you shall set apart, let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. And he shall be for a set-apart place, but a, fa- a stone of stumbling and a rock that makes for falling to both houses of Israel as a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and snared and taken. Now, listen to this. This is key. This is huge. It says, Yahweh of hosts, him shall you set apart. And then verse 14 says, and he shall be for a set apart place and and a stumbling block and a rock that makes you fall. So now we're told that Yahweh is that rock. Yahweh is the rock that causes stumbling to both houses of Israel, the house of Judah and the house of Ephraim. And we're also told that somehow, some way, in some form, 
You guys want to argue about it, argue about it all you want. Yeshua is Yahweh. I don't know how else you can make the connection in any other form. I don't want to get into a big debate. But here we're told that Yahweh is the stumbling block. We're told very clearly everywhere else that Yeshua is that rock, that the rock that they built on, the rock that's a rock of stumbling, the cornerstone that they despised, that's Yeshua. But we're also told it's Yahweh. But notice this. It's a stumbling block to both houses. How is it a stumbling block to both houses? Well, let's see. Yeshua, the chief cornerstone, the rock, is a stumbling block to Judah because the house of Judah doesn't believe or accept him as Mashiach. That's a big stumbling block for them. Seeing him as Mashiach is causing them a tremendous problem. And it's a tremendous stumbling block that they're having trouble getting over. They're tripping over that. It's causing them to stumble in their walk because they can't see Mashiach having already been here in the flesh. How is it a stumbling block for Ephraim, for the other house, the house of Israel, the lost tribes? Well, most of them are scattered and in the churches. They don't see him as Torah. They don't see the truth, the walking, talking, living Torah. They're tripping and, tri- and stumbling over a Greek, Romanized, you know, sort of very pagan-looking Jesus, uh, as opposed to the truth, the Torah, living flesh, walking, talking, the Devar, the Word made flesh, which is Yeshua. They can't see the walking, talking Torah. They think Jesus set them free, that the law was done away with, that all of that was for them and not for us and all this other stuff. They're tripping and stumbling over the truth of Mashiach, the foundation stone. This is, this is where they're falling. Then where are we as the Messianics in the middle tripping? And it doesn't mention it here in this verse, but you know where we're tripping? We're tripping over arguing over the nature of Mashiach, the nature of the Godhead, because we, we, can't, we can't figure out and fathom how Yahweh and Yeshua can be the same. We're having trouble understanding, well, how can this be referring to Yahweh, but also being referring to Yeshua? Now, I've got an idea of how that works, but that's just my idea of how it works. And you've got an idea of how that works, and that's just your idea of how that works. And it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm right and you're wrong, or you're right that I'm wrong. But what I'm saying here is, we need to embrace what it's talking about here, and not be arguing over something Yochanan said, look, we don't fully get all this. Why are we arguing over it? Why do we allow it to be a stumbling block? Do you, brethren, understand how many congregations are dividing and splitting over this? That are arguing and debating, and friends are, friendships are being broken, lifelong friendships are being broken, relationships are being destroyed over trying to debate the nature of the Mashiach and the nature of the connection between Yahweh and Yeshua and the Godhead. Where does it say anywhere in Scripture that we have to figure that out? Where does it say anywhere in Scripture that we have to understand that nature to be saved? Where does it say anywhere that we have to understand everything about what's not in the three-dimensional fleshly world in order to be in the kingdom? See, we're told to keep the Sabbath, honor mother and father, not to murder. We're told to eat kosher. We're told not to eat those other things. We're told to keep the feast. We're told how to love our neighbor as ourselves. We're told all these things are what we need to do. We're told in Matthew 25, in the sheep and the goats, to feed the hungry, clothe the naked. These are all things that are three-dimensionally on our level. We're also told to believe in the Almighty which we cannot see. We're also told to worship the Almighty, who we cannot see. We're also told to praise the Almighty, who we cannot see. But it never says anywhere that we have to understand the full nature of that Almighty. What we are to understand is that He is the rock, that He is the foundation, that Yeshua is the foundation, and that He is the chief cornerstone that's a stumbling, and that He is the despised and rejected cornerstone. We have to understand and accept these parts. But we don't have to understand and accept and under, uh, the details of that which can be, what that was, that is, and is to come. How do we understand that? How do we understand something that was, is, and is to come? How do we understand something that is outside of time? How do we understand something that always existed? How do we under, We can't. So why? I don't, I don't get the whole argument. I don't get why it's so important. Okay? I just don't get it. I know people that are Trinitarian. I know people that are not Trinitarian. I know people that are completely only about one, and there are people that believe in two. They argue all about the nature of what's, what the Godhead is made out of, and I don't see where scripturally it makes any difference whether you get it right or not. You are, as, you are to worship the Almighty. You are to accept Yeshua as Mashiach, and you are to follow and obey and be submissive to the Torah. I don't get anything else other than that. You know, Paul said, I just came to preach Yeshua and him crucified, and that's it. In other words, and all of the other ramifications that go with that. 
I don't see any of the apostles spending a whole lot of time trying to define the Godhead for anybody. And so we need to stop that. It's destroying the body. Yochanan 17, and in verse 21 and 23, Yeshua says, Father, I wish that they were one as we are one, so that the world would know that you sent me. And then he says it again in verse 23, the same thing. Slightly different wording, but essentially the same thing. Father, I want them to be one as we are one, so that the world understands that you sent me. That's what we need to have the world see. And we're fighting amongst each other and splitting and dividing and breaking relationships over our best guess of the nature of the Godhead, which, by the way, I don't care what you think you figured out out of Scripture, you're only guessing, okay? There is no scriptural verse that says, comes straight out and says, this is the nature of that which you can't understand because it's in a whole nother level than where you are. So you're guessing. So why break fellowship and relationships over your guess? It makes no sense. We need to stop doing that. You know, Titus... Paul tells Titus, he says, arguing over Torah, arguing over the God, and arguing over all this stuff is unprofitable and fruitless. It's completely unprofitable and pointless. We shouldn't be doing that. Now, if he's telling us not to argue about the Torah, which we actually have written instructions for, we certainly shouldn't be arguing about something that we can't even connect to. How do we connect to the creator of the universe somehow being in flesh, somehow dying, and then some people say, well, oh, but, you know, God can't die. Okay, well then, somehow, somebody had all this power, came and died, and then was resurrected, and now is sitting at the right hand of the Father with all power and glory. How do we understand all this? And why do we argue about it with such, such conviction and venom, like, if you don't see it the way I do, I can't possibly have a relationship with you? This is insanity. This is just pure insanity. This is, this is making the father probably cry when he watches his children fight over this stuff. What matters is, as long as we understand Yeshua is Mashiach, that Yeshua came and did what he was supposed to do, and that he's going to come and finish what he started, that's all that should matter. And when I'm in a room full of people, and I ask everybody, do we all believe Yeshua is Messiah? And they all raise their hands. Do we all understand that he came and died and on the third day was resurrected and is now sitting at the right hand? They all raise their hand. And when I say, and he's going to come back in power and glory as king of kings and, and, and master of masters, and they all raise their hand, yet there's still full, a room full of people that disagree about the Godhead. So then why are they disagreeing about anything? It doesn't say anywhere in Scripture we have to have all that. Okay? And so... The first John 3, which I quoted you earlier, is exactly the point. In first John 3, where he says, look, I don't fully get it. And let's face it, John was there. He's the beloved disciple. He's the one that was, that was so close with Yeshua that you think certainly he would get it. And John says, no, I don't. I don't really get it. Not completely. I just know that when he is revealed, we'll be like him. Because then and only then will we finally see him as he is. Right now, we're not seeing him completely as he is because we just don't have enough information. We're looking through the glass darkly. Okay? We're looking in the glass darkly. But what we do need to understand and we do need to embrace and we do need to focus on is that we are to embrace the living stone, the living cornerstone, the stone of stumbling, and not let it be a stumbling block. Let's read, before we wrap up here, one last verse in First Peter chapter 2. In First Peter chapter 2. First Kepha, First Peter chapter two, and in verse one, having put aside then all evil and all deceit and hypocrisies and, and, and envyings and all evil words, as newborn babes desire the unadulterated milk of the word in order that you grow by it, if indeed you have tasted that the master is good, drawing near to him a living stone rejected indeed by men but chosen by Elohim and precious. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a set-apart priesthood, to offer up spiritual slaughter offerings acceptable to Elohim through Yeshua Messiah. Because it is contained in the scripture where it says, See, I lay in Sion, a chief cornerstone chosen precious, and he who believes on him shall by no means be put to shame. We read that. This precious... Excuse me, this preciousness then is for you who believe, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become a chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock that makes for falling who stumble because they are disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. They stumble because they're disobedient to the word, not because they haven't been able to figure out the nature of the Godhead. Okay? There's no verse that says figuring that out is required for salvation, for entering into the kingdom. 
He says, but you, he says, you, verse 9, are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a set-apart nation, a people for a possession that you should proclaim the praises of him who called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but now the people of Elohim, who had not obtained compassion, but now obtained compassion, which is a quote directly from Hosea. Beloved ones, verse 11, I appeal to you as sojourners and pilgrims to abstain from the fleshly lusts which battle against the life, having your behavior among the Gentiles good, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, let them, by observing your good works, esteem Elohim in a day of visitation. So what is he saying here? He says, look, you need to embrace the Torah, you need to embrace Yeshua, you need to build your foundation, the stone, the rock, that is a stumbling block to those who do not understand. He says, and then because you're on that foundation, do not give in to the fleshly lusts of the world, he says, which battle against life. He says, have your behavior be what it needs to be, even though they may be speaking against you and talking against you and accusing you or judging you or mocking you. He says, but by observing your good works, they may esteem Elohim in a day of visit, excuse me, in a day of visitation. This is key. This is key. Brethren, listen. I want to exhort, I want to encourage, I want to just stir you to the deepest part of your foundation to embrace Yeshua, the rock in the desert, to embrace Yeshua who is the way, the truth, and the life, to embrace Yeshua, he is your rejected stone, do not reject him, embrace him, embrace the rejected stone, which, the, which is the chief cornerstone, which the builders rejected, build your foundation, which Yeshua is the foundation of your, of, your, of your house. Build it deep. Dig deep that foundation and place it deep. Yeshua will return. And when he returns, he's going to smash the kingdoms of this world and restore the kingdom of Israel, where he will reign from the new Jerusalem as king of kings forever and ever. We didn't read the verses in Daniel, which we didn't have time for, but we could have, where it shows that that rock will come and smash the kingdoms of this world. So let us not neglect the rock who brought us forth, and let us be found hearing and doing his words. B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach, in the name of Yeshua HaMessiah, I, I say this prayer for all of us. Amen and Amen. I hope this teaching, as always, was a blessing to you. Never take what I say as being the definitive answer to anything. Please let it just be something that stirs you to go and search the word yourself, to be in prayer and meditation, and ask the Ruach HaKodesh, the teacher inside of you, to show you what you were supposed to get out of these sections so that you can grow into something that he can then fit together to build his house.